thank you for being here today. Um, we wanted to give you different perspective of what peace is today, or at least how do we try to achieve peace and how do we build peace today. Very hard thing to achieve, obviously. Um, particularly given the fact that today we're bombarded with information, not always good information. Um, how do we achieve that peace um, given uh, the, the level of information that we're getting that's so negative and how do we achieve inner peace to obtain world peace? So um, I don't know, are there people in the room right now that meditate? All right, okay. So I'm a meditator too. I've been for 16 years now and I didn't have time to meditate before I got here. So I figured <laughs> before we talk about peace, we could do one minute of meditation together, regardless of the sound. Actually, that might work for our benefit. So tune out, tune them out. <laughs> We're gonna stay polite. Tune them out and then get on with the thing. So I'm gonna invite you all to close your eyes. Take a deep breath. and think about peace for a second. All right, thank you. They even clapped, <laughs> who knows, maybe it was for us. Um, all right, so how do we achieve peace today? Um, one of the first thing I think is important to, to look at, I, I learned um, through my meditation practice that one, one of the biggest thinkers on peace think that peace starts within your radius. So if you start within your home, then you expand it to your workplace, your community. That's how peace starts. So I think today, if we will really be able to build peace, um, it really starts with us. So thank you for everyone being here. It means that matters to you. So today we have two great speakers representing peace um, in the way that they approach it, in the way that they work, in the way that they live. Um, Amandine, perhaps you want to start and introduce yourself and tell us how you and how you envision peace today and how you live peace and how through your journey you found ways to expand um, on peace today. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Amandine Roche. I've been working for United Nations for the last 18 years, mainly on human rights and peace process and women empowerment. Great, Roberta? My name is Roberta Annan, I'm from Ghana. Um, I work with the United Nations as well for four years, but I left the UN and wanted to be, I've always been an entrepreneur, so I started my own company, and the core focus of my company is to make a positive impact, um, especially in the lives of women in Africa. So I have found, I started a company called African Fashion Fund that supports young African designers with funding, business support, and access to markets. And then there's me. Um, I started Who Cares Chronicles uh, in 2008 in New York at the very beginning of the crisis. I wanted to focus on great practices in the corporate social responsibility. Uh, I felt there was a lack of uh, measures that were being put in place and a lack of visibility to those great practices. So I started Who Cares Chronicles and I started to promote a new role in the executive world, the one of chief caring officer or chief care officer. The idea behind it is to promote empathy and compassion in the, in the business world. And it expanded to more than just the corporate world, but the world as a whole. Um, and we put into place um, several initiatives. Uh, the most recent one, which has been one focus that has been around, I mean, that we wanted to put into place for a while, is uh, to create um, content-driven call for actions and I will be telling you later on, after Amandine, about how um, our first 
uh, content-driven call for action is actually relating to, to peace as well. So, Amandine, you want to start? Sure. So my journey to peace started by meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I was fortunate enough at 18, I met His Holiness. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's not working. You're supposed to see really great pictures of her. Of her, and it's not working. Oh, okay, it's working yeah. now. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry. Okay. We have many slides in front of us. Okay, <laughs> great. This one is working. So I did meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama when I was 18 at the University of Law in Bordeaux, and he spoke about the violation of human rights in Tibet and the non-violent resistance of the Tibetans. And looking at him so peaceful, so compassionate, so altruistic, I understood at this time that since the, the war starts in the mind of a man, it's in the mind of a man that the foundation of peace must be built. And it really changed my life because, because I met His Holiness, I decided to focus my, line, my life on human rights, political science, and international relations to join the United Nations. And I did join the United Nations uh, first uh, in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and after in Afghanistan, where I spent 14 years on and off. And my main focus was to work with women. And why? Because I do believe that patriarchy is over. And I do believe that women are vector of peace. Why? Because women have a vagina to create and no testosterone to destroy. And um, my main focus was working mainly on women empowerment. So we hire civic educators women to explain to the population what is human rights, what is democracy. And we really encourage them to uh, do door-to-door -door campaign to explain to women to go out of the house and to promote human rights and democracy. And we encourage them to become a deputy senators, to become leaders. You guys hear fine, right? Can you hear? Because I've Speak louder. The acoustic is not so good, so that's why. And um, it was very fascinating because actually it was more like a psychological work because they were so scared after Taliban regimes. They were just staying at home. So we have to really tell them it's over, now is your time to be a leader. And so we did so many gatherings, so many meetings, explaining now you have a right. We went also to speak with nomads, as you can see. And finally, finally, after a year and a half of intensive work, we have the best award ever. On October 9, 2004, for the first time, women were allowed to vote since the Taliban regime. And they show up at, uh, in front of a polling station at 6 a.m., despite the fact that the Taliban were telling them that they will send suicide bomber, these guys under the burqa. They didn't care. They just wanted to vote. It was her best reward. They were showing me she was very proud to have voted with the ink of the finger. But when I finally came back home because three of my international colleagues got kidnapped, I was suffering of PTSD, burnout, depression, and anxiety. My belly was like three months pregnant, and I didn't know what to do. I discovered I have kind of cancerous cells in my stomach because I was so stressed out by all the death threats, all the bombing assassination I went through for a year and a half in Afghanistan. So I saw one healer, and he told me, you cannot keep on doing this type of work for peace if you are not at peace with yourself. And I start to ask myself, is true who I am to work for peace in the world if I'm completely broken, burned out, depressed, anxious? I should better stay at home because I cannot serve the population I'm coming. And I feel like I say, yeah, I'm like a fraud, actually. I'm not really authentic. So instead of going back to Afghanistan, I decided to come back to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, the Tibetan government in exile in north of India. And I went on deep yoga meditation retreat. And at some point, his holidays, the Dalai Lama said during his talk, you cannot bring outer peace if you don't focus on your inner peace first. Exactly what Nora was saying, you should start by yourself. And because you find peace within, you create peace within your family. And if you have peace in your family, 
you can bring peace in your community. And if you bring peace into your community, you bring peace into your town, into your country, and into your world. It's a ripple effect. So instead of going back, I decided to take a backpack and I went all around India to meet the spiritual master who teach inner peace and non-violence. And I got so inspired. And when I finally healed myself after a year, United Nations called me back and asked me if I want to go back to Afghanistan. I said, oh my gosh, again. And I said, yeah, sure, let's try. But this time when I came back with my practice, yoga meditation every day, because I become a yoga meditation teacher, and it completely changed. And when I came back, I decided to create the Amanuddin Foundation. Amanuddin is the name of a Taliban gave it to me when I first came in Afghanistan, when I did apply in 2001. Aman stands for peace and Din for religion. So Amanuddin means the religion of peace. It was a nice coincidence. And with the Amanuddin Foundation, we opened a school of Torch of Light School, where there is 350 kids where we teach them the tool of inner peace. It's like we sew the seed of peace in the new generation. And so we were teaching them yoga, meditation, and they love it so much, like everybody would try. But we have hard time with our parents because some of them were Taliban, and they consider that bringing in yoga, meditation is like bringing Hinduism and Buddhism in Afghanistan, which is absolutely not the case. Uh, I did check online. And uh, to my surprise, yoga come from Pakistan in Baluchistan, and meditation come from Afghanistan. But we were teaching everywhere to street kids and to the kids in school, to soldiers, even to some Taliban. We didn't put the picture. But finally, when I look at the time I spent in Afghanistan, I realized that United Nations sent us to war zone with not a single preparation. I got evacuated four times from Afghanistan. The first time in 2001, I got detained and exchanged by the Taliban. The second time in 2004, three of my international colleagues got kidnapped. In 2009, six of my international colleagues got assassinated. And in 2014, I did face a suicide bomber in a polling station. So I realized it was time for me to get out of Afghanistan, and instead I went to see Ban Ki-moon. And in Ban Ki-moon, I did tell him that what, was, what, was, what he was doing for the staff on the front line, what he was doing for which type of program he was offering for us to cope with all the stress, and he didn't have any idea. And I got again inspiring by his holiness, saying that this is what the planet needs. The planet needs more healer. And I realized we need to give a tool of inner peace to all the workers on the front line. So I decided to create the inner peace core, like the peace core, but for inner, from inner peace to outer peace, to just prevent the burnout and the PTSD. Because when you have a PTSD, you are like 75% dead. Your mind, body, and spirit is completely disconnected. So we offer the tool to reconnect, or at least. So I just offer to the United Nations this report from UNHCR saying that this is what the staff on the front line is lacking, a sense of purpose. They are lacking a skill for stress management, attention skill, emotion regulation skill, and they want more exercise to cope with. So that's how I decided to create the inner peace keeping, bringing the, peace, the inner peace into an outer peace organization. And with a group of experts in mindfulness, in emotional intelligence, in stress management, in conscious leadership, we brainstormed for six months. And we finally launched last year in Jordan with UNHCR, the inner peace keeping program. And we offer this two days program to the humanitarian working with Syrian refugees who are completely stressed out or burned out. This is in Lebanon, close by Beka Valley. And after six months, we send a monitoring and evaluation team to just evaluate the program. And we realized that, yes, the symptoms of PTSD were decreasing. The depression symptoms were decreasing. The anxiety symptoms were decreasing and less burnout when they put into practice all the tools of inner peace we were offering to them. 
And surprisingly, a lot of them also uh, resigned from their job because it start to realize they were so stressed out. And now I'm focusing more on refugees. Uh, I do believe women can heal women, and uh, refugees are the most vulnerable population, and where they all suffer of PTSD. I'm just back from MAFRAC. This is all the percentage from refu for the refugees. So they suffer of avoidance, hopelessness, loss of interest, anger, fear. And this is how in a refugee camp we offer the yoga class, uh, also a dialogue class where finally they can speak about their trauma. Because they realize women, it's like a woman cycle. All these women went through so much pain and suffering, but they keep for themselves. The simple fact that you open up and share with your sisters, already you start the healing. This is at Mafrak at the Jordan uh, Syrian border. And we are arriving to the end. So um, I just wanted to finish with you about this. Uh, maybe maybe yes, you can maybe tell, later. maybe you can share, because I, I would like the audience to leave with something from this discussion on how, what would you recommend or what are the tools you would recommend, simple tools, to be peace, as a, as a, to be an agent of peace for yourself and for others? I have to say the most successful tool I offer, I mean the one they prefer, like refugee prefer, it's the breathing exercise. Very, sim very simple one. Do you want me to do it? Or? Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's breathe. <laughs> okay, so let's do it. So everybody sit in a very comfortable si position. You don't cross your leg, you keep your you keep your back straight, you put your feet on the floor, and you close your eyes. And you're going to take a deep inhale. Inhale where you really make it like a balloon with your belly, like you really fulfill your belly with full of oxygen. And when you inhale, you just inhale the peace, the harmony, the joy, the happiness, the light coming inside yourself. And you imagine all this pure oxygen coming in all the part of your body. So you take this deep inhale and you stop breathing. And when you exhale, You exhale all the stress, all the anxiety, all the depression, all the frustration, all the toxicity that you don't want in your body anymore. So we are going to do it three more times. You take a deep inhale, a light, peace, joy, harmony. Stop. And you slowly, gently exhale. <sighs> One more time, inhale. Stop. Exhale. <sighs> now slowly you can open your eyes. Thank you. You didn't expect that, did you guys? You thought you were just going to talk about peace. You didn't think you were going to have some breathing exercises and meditation. Um, all right, I'm just going to share with you what Who Cares has been doing in regards to peace. Um, I want to make sure that they have connected the film that we're supposed to show. It's very short. I don't know if she's looking at me. Hola. Hola. Over here. <laughs> So what Who Cares, so what Who Cares stands for, again, is just to remind you, is, is initially we were looking at great practices in the corporate world, and then it very quickly expanded into great practices in communities and how 
we can enhance empathy. Empathy is something that you can, it's like a muscle. So the more um, you expand on it, the more you focus on it, the more empathic you become. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but what we wanted to do, we, we sort of researched how you enhance empathy. So there's a lot of ways you can enhance it. There's actually a proven science. Today we know that there are moments of our history where we had empathic deficiency. You can think of the Great Wars, um, the Nazi era, where you had incredible empathic deficiencies. And you can think of moments of history where we have incredible moments of empathic communion with uh, our other human family. You can think of a recent uh, episode in France, uh, 20 years apart, the World Cup happens and everyone comes together regardless of socioeconomic, race, or gender. These moments don't necessarily have to happen just when we win the World Cup. We can have these experiences on a daily basis. It's just a choice. Um, what we wanted to do, we also noticed that a lot of the times when people talk about corporate social responsibility or empathy, people show the negative. So they will show, oh, this company just spilled uh, X amount of oil in a, in a river or, or chemicals in a river or in an ocean. We'll always point out the negatives. But when we point out the negatives, we forget the positive that the company may do or the person may do. By sh shifting that, just like you would look at a person, I'm not perfect, none of us here are perfect, but we want to enhance and focus on the good so that the good grows. That's really how empathy works. The more you focus on the good, the more empathy and the more goodness you can see around you. Um, one of the ways that we felt was the most compelling was to create content-driven call for actions. So how do we do that? How do we do that when <laughs> you don't have a budget, um, <laughs> you've never shot a documentary, and uh, people ask you all the time, but why did you start Who Cares? Like, why? Or like, what, what um, you know, legitimacy do you have? So here's my come back to that question. I'm human. I live on this planet. I care about a lot of people, my family, but also extended family, including Roberta, who's a really dear friend and a sister. Um, I have a child. I have adopted children. We have a school in, in Haiti, which I'm very proud of. Um, and I want to have a good experience while I'm here. That's why I created Who Cares? Because Who Cares is not my project, just like all the change makers here. It's not their project. They just put a blueprint on, like you did, and you wait for everyone to come and be part of it. So how do we do that? We created a film. Um, one of the main topics that we wanted to focus on that we felt needed more empathy recently was the refugee crisis. One of the things that very few people know, and a lot of people sort of focus on different data on the refugees, the most accurate data that we can give is that 68.5 million people today are considered refugees. So that you have different denominations. You have asylum seekers, you have uh, displaced people, there's different ways, but if you take it as a whole, it's 68.5 million people. More than half of that are children under the age of 18. So when you know that data and you get up in the morning, you get your latte, you go to your office, life's good, <laughs> you're living on this side of the world, of course, you may not have the connection to these people that are living in refugee camps or living in displaced situations or that are asylum seekers. How do we create platforms or content that makes you, you drinking latte working person in your office, connect to that? The challenge is to create something small, quick, and to the point. So when you don't have a budget, I'm going back to that because it's very important, um, and you're trying to do this on your own, you actually have to rely on empathy. And this is when the magic happens. So a friend from 25 years ago in Canada who's here today, and she flew all the way from Calgary to be here, because tomorrow we have the premiere of the documentary, and I will tell you more about this after. A friend from Calgary, we put an Indiegogo together, and she raises the funds for us to pay for the crew 
We get an incredible team in Paris that does all the post-production because they relate and have empathy for those people. They hear the story and they're like, I want to be part of this. And we have an amazing crew also on site in Lebanon and we decide to go to a refugee camp uh, at the border of Syria in Lebanon and we book our tickets, we pay for our tickets, we don't have a budget for it so we just decide to just go. And we arrive there and we have very, a very, very difficult time to get access to the camp because you don't go into a refugee camp so easily. You have checkpoints, you have to get authorizations. Um, it's, it's very difficult to do that. And the, the idea was to, again, keeping in mind that Who Cares is only staying on the positive, we wanted to create a story that was compelling but wasn't sad. We didn't want to be like, oh, pull out the violence, sit down and just feel sorry and miserable about this story. The story was to look at and give a voice to these millions of children that are voiceless. We don't know who they are, what their names are, what they live like, I mean, what's their life on a daily basis. So we went there and we wanted to give it from the perspective of a seven-year-old daughter, very close in age to my daughter because I felt it would be most candid in terms of the conversation. It turns out it, it is beautifully candid and through the prism of color. The color of Who Cares, our logo is pink because it's the color of empathy. And I always tell this story, it makes people laugh, so we'll see if that makes you laugh. But we relate to that in psychology to the pink color um, relating to the mother. And the first initiation of caring that you have is through your mother's nipple when she breastfeeds. And regardless of race, the nipple is pink. So that's what psychology <laughs> tells us about empathy. So. Who cares? Our color is pink. Thinking of the nipple. Everybody's laughing inside. I see smiles. Um, and if you look at a color chart, the last shade of pink before we get to blue, and blue in, and we know all, all know that blue is sadness. The last shade of, of pink before we get to blue is indigo. So indigo is the name of the film that we shot. It's 11 minutes. It tells the story of Rahaf. She tells the story through different colors. And Indigo is a parallel in a metaphor to invite us all to think of indigo as our last chance to care. If we think of 68.5 million refugees, more than half of that children, our human family is not taking care of more than half of 68.5 million children. That's a problem. And the other thing that comes up a lot when we do the work that we do with Who Cares is but I really want to help and really people do. They really want to help, they just don't know how to. So we have Fold One, a very short film, compelling, positive, based on color, so that it's not, again, we didn't need to have bombs or, you know, we saw in the camp a lot of children with scars and horrible stories that will really break your heart and lead you into a burnout. But we chose to focus on the positive. The second fold is we link up to our website three ways in which you can give or donate or participate. You don't necessarily have to give in funds. You can get involved. There's three ways that we have chosen on our website. Um, one of them takes place in Paris, and it's called Va Faire Cure Neuf, um, which is started by this amazing person that couldn't be here tonight because she had an operation, uh, surgery, uh, Letitia Calcamo. Um, but there's many ways in, in which you can participate. So I'm just going to have you see the trailer, and if you want to see the whole uh, film, you can see it tomorrow at Club de l'Etoile, because Change Now is not only a conference, it's also a film festival in which we have several content that are very engaging and compelling and will inspire you to want to do your part. Because again, all of these change-making projects are blueprints. They cannot be alive without us all. Um, hola. She's going to hate me after this. Excuse me. Can we have the trailer now? I don't know if you will hear the sound. Maybe you'll just see the images. But now that I've told you kind of the story, you'll know. Um, maybe I can guide you through. I'm <laughs> 
حسسني عن انه بدأت كتوز So just to give you a bit of information about how we shot it. So it's very hot. We only have a day, because remember, we don't have a budget. <laughs> I'll say that again. <laughs> I'm very proud of that, because we managed to do something really good with no budget. So that's, that's what I mean by you don't need, in order to care, I have a very demanding job that I give my whole to. I have who cares, and I put all that I could, all my free time to do this. So anybody can do something. We all have the power. We all are very powerful people. All, each one of you in the room is very powerful. So I just, I'm inviting you. She's to taught you how to breathe. I'm inviting you to use your superpowers. One of the things about the movie, and then I'll pass it on to, to Roberta to share her experience with peace. Um, we wanted to show the life of the camp, but without the negative. So we try to th think of like very creative ways to have an experience of what it feels like to be in a camp without feeling um, sad. So we had the kids run with confettis in the camp so that we could shoot the camp with and see like the plastics and like how it's built and the tires on top to keep the, the, the wind from taking away the plastic coverage um, without making it a very sad experience through the visual. But the visual is beautiful. We were very fortunate. We had uh, someone that worked for um, uh, a major channel in, uh, in the world uh, for 10 years. He was covering war conflict, and he, he was the director of cinematography, as you can see, it's really beautifully shot. Um, and again, just to close it on peace, what's interesting in the, in the movie, and I'm not going to give you, um, I'm not going to give away too much, but when we ask Rahaf, that's her name, Rahaf, what peace was, in Arabic, the word peace can be understood in two ways. It can be your health but it can also be peace. So initially she's like, well, peace is that I'm taking care of myself, I'm healthy. Um, so she understood that notion of peace. But when we talked about war, uh, or our peace, or the absence of conflict, she didn't know what it was. Um, but when we said, do you know what war is, right away she knew. So I think that we just have to ask ourselves this question. If we live in a world today in 2018 where we have this much technology, and they all had cell phones in the camp, by the way, um, we have this much technology, we have this much possibilities, access to each other as, as humans. Why is it that a seven-year-old three hours away from Paris does not know what peace means? So I'm inviting you all to do your part in the blueprint. And I know for sure that as being a participant of this conference, there is something within you that is either doing something or wants to do something. So I look forward to seeing your your participation in the peace program. Roberta, your turn. You're gonna tell us about how, through business, you create peace around you. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, again, let me just congratulate both of you for um, your initiatives. I think the common um, denominator here is that we care, right? You have to care enough to want to start an initiative like this and to raise money and to um, basically shed a, bit more of, um, shed a bit of light on what is really happening in the world. You have to really care to be able to do that. And I think my journey is very similar, but it's like a different you know, um, process. Um, as I said earlier, I work with the United Nations. So I'm from Ghana. Um, Ghana is uh, in West Africa. Um, capital Accra. I was born and raised in Ghana until I was about in my early teens and I moved to India with my family um, and I lived in India for a bit and then moved to North America where I got my, um, to, I would say I, was, I went to college and grad school and I studied as a scientist. <laughs> um, so I have a master's degree in biotech but I think what science helped me to become is a problem solver. And I've always, I mean, I grew up of, um, w you know, with a family full of philanthropists. I remember seeing my mother at a very young age um, going to villages where, you know, of underprivileged children and organizing Christmas parties for them. And I remember I was very young, but I would be arranging chairs with my brother and, you know, feeding children. I remember we would donate quite a bit of money and. You know, we weren't from a wealthy family, 
but my mom had a heart and she always wanted to create more opportunities for other people. She would pay tuition and even today she's retired and she's still doing it. So I picked up pieces of, you know, this characteristic and, and I wasn't surprised that I ended up working at the United Nations where, you know, the intrinsic philanthropist in me coupled with a bit of, I'll say, development focused work, I've set up my business in a way where I'm giving back consistently. Um, so fast forward, what I'm doing now. So after I left with the United Nations, I started my own boutique consulting business. And that business was really trying to advise, especially ultra high net worth individuals, people that have 100 million and above, on how to structure philanthropy. Because I found it so strange that the wealthiest people <laughs> especially in Africa, did not really have any structure or like they weren't thinking about giving back, you know, in a way that you see it in the, in the West, where you have family foundations that have been around from, for generations. We didn't have that structure. And when you ask a lot of family officers in, in Africa, their, their thing is, oh, but we support, we pay tuition. When, when there's a flood, we donate. But there wasn't any structure. And then if you compare the budget they spent on themselves versus what they were doing to support society, I found it quite appalling because even through my consulting company, I was putting about 50% of my profit into supporting people. Um, I started a foundation called the African Fashion Fund. It's actually a foundation. People think it's an actual um, fund. And through that, I was giving an opportunity to fashion designers and creatives in Africa. I was doing a fellowship, an annual fellowship program, which I sponsored personally. I would, you know, pay for their uh, tuition to study with established brands in New York for six months. And I'll pay the whole thing. And people looked at me and they're like, why, why do you care so much? Why are you doing this? And I, you know, I always tell people that I care because I see that opportunity, you know, like talent is very common, but opportunity isn't. So you need to be able to give people the opportunity, which is financial support, you know, business acumen. You need to be able to connect them with other people that can help their businesses grow. And that is what I really wanted to promote through my foundation. And I'm happy to say that since I started it in 2014, I've been able to support five African designers in New York to gain minimum of six months of an experience and when they go back home, you know, they've learned, you know, they've been out of, out of their comfort zone. So they develop setting skill set. And I went to school overseas, so I know what being out of your comfort zone means. It gives you a very different dimension on thinking, you're faster, you're more effective. And their businesses have really, really done really well because they've, they've had this opportunity to go overseas and to study under established brands. So it's really coupling the creativity with business acumen. And now they're doing very well um, in their businesses. And I'm proud that, you know, I put my little, like you said, with no budget. <laughs> and, you know, but I always carved out a certain amount that I made for my business just to do this. But how, how do you find, I mean, obviously you, you worked for the UN in energy and environment. Yes. Um, you are now championing fashion in Africa. Um, how? How difficult is it for you to, to build a business and to weave in peace? Because obviously you're doing this in regions that are affected by, yes. there are conflicted regions of the world. Yes, I was gonna come to the, the, the notion of peace. You know, I think one thing that you need to address if you want, especially in my part of the world is poverty is the biggest contributor to conflict and you know, other socioeconomic issues that we have. So to be able to, you need to tackle poverty at the roots if you want to be able to promote peace. Um, you know, there's an issue of migration where you have a lot of young people. So I'll give you a statistic. The population of Africa is 65% of people that are under the age of 25. That means that in the next 10 years, these people are going to be left without jobs, you know, proper hospitals, proper schools. And what is the, um, by default, they would want to go and see greener pastures in other places. 
like Europe. And <laughs> the journey of migration is a tough one, and we've all seen this. Um, so if you create opportunities for people within Africa and create, give them an avenue to be educated, to be empowered economically, they wouldn't need to travel overseas to, to see greener pastures. So that's what I've been doing in my personal capacity to promote peace, is by creating opportunities for people to be economically empowered, especially women. So what you see happen, in, in, uh, especially with women in Africa, is when they gain money, they, when, they, when, they, when they work, they give their money to their husbands. You know, it goes right back to taking care of the family, taking care of their kids' education. When a man makes money, it goes into his pocket. So we are really focusing on women and finding avenues to empower women economically. And I'll tell you how we've done this. So we, after the African Fashion Fund, I also saw the need of um, helping successful uh, businesses, especially gain access to international markets. So we started an actual um, investment vehicle called Fraulein Group. And we've invested with our own uh, resources and investors' money, about five million into six brands. And what we, we call, Fraulein Group is an investment vehicle, but it's also a social impact in vehicle because we really want to focus on making an impact. So it's like the, tr the, the triple bottom line for us. So you make a profit, you have to also effect change. So it's a people prof um, profit and then the planet. So also looking at ways in which that you can create and promote sustainable environmental um, atmosphere or I would say ecosystem for the businesses. So, so this is what we've done on the Fraulein Group. And in each brand that we've we invest in, we want them to do something that will promote social economic um, empowerment as well within the, and these are all African brands. So I'll give you an example. We have one um, brand that is a shea butter brand that um, is using, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with shea butter. It's made from shea nuts, which is grown in the northern parts of Ghana. And it's gathered and harvested by women, mainly. So we have cooperatives of women that we're empowering. So we buy these from them at a pr premium price, rather than you know just taking it from them cheaply. And we process this and make products that are sold internationally. And then 10% of the profits go back into the community. So this young lady who started this project, I was really impressed by how she's looking at social impact. She has a school where she takes care of 400 children, and they all get a free education. And it's from K to 12. So all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade. She takes care of them. She feeds them. She provides them with school uniforms. So 10% of the proceeds go back into this school to support her educational initiative. So each brand has that kind of social impact, which is so important to us because we feel that if you are able to look at, address your own issues internally as Africa, rather than always going outside and looking for aid, you know, because um, we are so blessed with natural resources. We are blessed with people who are talented. We don't need to be you know, roaming on the streets of Europe, begging on, you know, begging on the streets for money. You can do it internally. And as a matter of fact, you will be here tomorrow with one of the brands that you, that you chaperone yeah. uh, for a panel on, on sustainable fashion and the future of fashion. And do you feel that Africa will find solutions for peace through fashion? Because fashion in Africa is so rich and diverse and it has such a potential, huge potential for growth. Do you think that's one of the ways, I, at least that's the way you're using? Yes, definitely. I'm looking at fashion to promote peace because I feel fashion is something that we all can relate to, right? If Gucci launches a new collection, trust me, there are people in Africa who are also going online to look at the collection as you see people in Canada or other parts of the world. So it's something that talks to everybody regardless of your culture, your background, your gender. So it's really a tool to promote peace. But what I feel Africa, especially right now, is that we're in a position to change and even promote sustainable fashion even more because we are an untapped market, right? When, you comes to, when it comes to fashion. 
Um, and we can look at, especially in the area of manufact manufacturing and production of, of um, uh, apparel and other fashion goods, we can look at doing things sustainably. So using susta raw materials that are sustainable because we are blessed with natural resources. We can look at promoting fair wages, you know, so we don't want a situation like, you know, other parts of the world that I'm not going to mention where they are, um, you know, employing children to manufacture apparel. We are in a position to pay fair wages. So we can even drive this whole thing about sustainable fashion um, because it's an untapped market. And the thing is, we in Africa, we have the opportunity to leapfrog in technologies and other things that, so we've learned from other markets and because things are so nascent on our part of the world, we can actually redefine what sustainable fashion is. And if you look at what has happened with mobile technologies, for instance, we do not have landlines, but everybody has mobile phones. Even the woman in the village has a mobile phone. Why can't we use, why can't we do the same with fashion? And you know, redefine what sustainable fashion is. And that is what we are trying to promote. And we're also looking at strategic partnerships with the likes of Caring Group and the LVMH and all that, who can use or like consider Africa as a destination to source sustainable raw material and even recruit talent in a fair way. Because right now everybody, I'm wearing, everything I have here is made by an African designer, right? I only promote things that I care about. So if I'm going to buy something, this is made by women in Nigeria who are widows and it's silk, but this is a very, um, it's a tie and dye. So it's traditional, you know, kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, printing that we, we have in Africa. So we have this in Ghana and in Nigeria and other parts of West Africa, it's tie and dye, but it's on silk. So if, I'm one, if I wanna see this in like a Barney's, I would pay a premium amount because I know the cause behind it. And the world is gradually shifting into that. So we can really change the narrative and we can promote peace through this and by supporting our economies and finding a way to empower people, especially women. Especially women. <laughs> Are there any questions? I think it's always nice to have interactions versus just talking and not exchanging. Anyone would have something they would like to ask? Anybody? Just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, and just to build on new points, I wanted to ask you how you, how do you create this dialogue with like big companies you just mentioned in, in sustainability and how we know Stella McCartney one, was one of the, you know, like, how do you say, but anyway, she was one of the first one to do that in the field of fashion. So how do you create that dialogue and how do you have them, you know, interested in what you're doing basically? I think, you know, there's actually been a shift. I always call it like, because what's happening now is people are becoming more conscious. So you have the likes of Stella McCartney's, even Donna Karen, who are looking at ethical fashion. You know, they want to promote luxury, but luxury that makes sense, luxury that promotes, um, you know, empowers other people. So it's not just about fashion and the premium, but there has to be a story and some social impact. And that is becoming, uh, you know, that's a topic that I hear of. There's even an entity within the United Nations under the International Trade Center called Ethical Fashion Initiative. And I believe Stella McCartney was even part of that where they've done a lot of, they've supported um, and produced a lot in Africa to you know, provide gainful employment to, to local artisans. So this is, there's a huge movement, but I am here. I have an agenda to talk to people because I think fashion is such an important, it's a trillion dollar industry, you know. So we need to, to tackle things. We need to create and forge solid partnerships. So my goal is to have conversations with like-minded people who have sustainability at the core of their business and to see how the whole Africa story can fit into it. Because it's something that I am very passionate about and I've promoted, I've put my own money, my sweat, my tears <laughs> into it. And I'm at a point where I want to, you know, 
to create the partnerships that will really make this thing, you know, become, make, make more of an impact on the world. So we're almost running out of time. We still have a few minutes, but um, perhaps we can just sum it up by the few keys to obtain peace through inner peace. Actually, I don't know if you can have the last slide I had before. Let's see. No, it's not working. Okay. So I wanted to finish with a Native American uh, story, the story of a hummingbird. Some people know Le Colibri in French, yeah? So uh, the story is this one. There is a big fire in the forest, and all the animals are fleeing the forest. The lion, do you know the story? Okay, no. Okay, there is lion, there is tiger, there is jaguar, who else? And uh, what else? Oh, it's here, great, okay. And, um, and at some point there is this small hummingbird coming to the river and just taking some drop of water to put on the top of a fire and all the animals are looking at him, saying, well, you think that you're going to extinguish the fire with just, just a small drop of water? And the Umbinger reply, at least I'm doing my part. So we can just finish to, today just by asking yourself, what do you do to contribute to more peace? Thank you. They come to change now and get ideas to create their own projects, right? <laughs> also, I wanted to tell you tomorrow, if you're interested to learn more tool of inner peace, I will be teaching that at 5 p.m. And uh, also, I do a workshop in Paris for two days on inner peacekeeping next week. So if you're interested, you can come to see me. And come again, and um, it Change Now is not just a conference. It's also the film festival, who's been championed by great people. We've selected great movies, great documentaries that will inspire you and give you ideas on how to do your part and how to be the hummingbird. Um, the, you will be able also to see Indigo. It's a very short film. It's 11 minutes. Again, no budget. <laughs> Kidding. No, no, we wanted to make a short film. Uh, <laughs> it was not about the budget. Um, so you could see it tomorrow at 6 p.m. It's at Club de l'Etoile. The whole documentary festival is at Club de l'Etoile. Um, we had great people selecting the film. Uh, some of the films, I mean, uh, for Indigo, we'll have the crew that will be there. You can ask questions about how the film was shot. And also other uh, documentary makers will be there. You can have an exchange with them. And uh, tomorrow, we'll have a great fashion panel that I will let Roberta speak about, but it's on sustainable fashion, um, how um, we can also, because essentially, when you think about peace, peace and actually war throughout history was fought over a land, a river, a property, power, money. Um, so economy and peace are very linked. The way we change the economy, we change uh, our world, and it's peace or it's war. Um, so sustainability is the new peace. You can achieve peace through inner peace. Um, look at beyond the you know, common uh, and think of different frontiers of business. Um, and Roberta, Such I want to close. Fashion, close? and I, I, I like what you said, and I think fashion can play a, you know, a major role in this because it it relates to everybody, regardless, like I said, of your culture, your background, your agenda. It's like music, right? So I think this is an, and please come and check out the Ghanaian designer, um, Chocolates by Kweku Bediako. We ran a competition in Ghana uh, to bring one designer here, um, and he won it, and he's bringing his entire collection. So he'll be at the showroom with all the other sustainable fashion brands. Thank you. See you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you for being here. Namaste. Thank you.